One. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick McIntyre. I'm with Raza Hoda. He's my colleague. Uh, he wrote the article along with many other writers uh, that we're going to be presenting today. It is entitled Risk of Malignancy in the Categories of Papanicolaou Society, a Cytopathology System for Reporting Pancreatobiliary Cytology. Can you add more words to this title? No, I, I would have preferred a colon. <laughs> uh, Followed by another. I, I think I think we need uh, a question mark in there. We need a question mark. So uh, Raza and I work together in his uh, office right next door. Thank you for the journey over here. How was your commute? It was great. That was a good commute. It's paid for. It's paid for. Yes, <laughs> we'll submit a bill to ASC. Um, so this is a live moderated session. We're trying to do more of these now. It's kind of a new thing, so bear with us. Um, but uh, last night we did a Twitter event. Yes. Uh, we were tweeting out questions about the article. Thank you for all those that participated. Um, and hopefully uh, we learned something. How was, how was your Twitter event? How was tweeting? It was great. I usually stay off of Twitter. Yes. Uh, I find it, it gets people into more trouble than good. But it was great. It was a good exercise for my thumbs. Okay. Uh, and it was great to engage with, with, with people who were like us around the country. Yes, no one's ever gotten in trouble uh, tweeting anything before, so. No, <laughs> no. Anywho, um, back to the article. So I'm going to go through it, and then uh, we'll stop. I have some questions along the way we can talk about, um, and then also, you know, future directions. So this is me. Uh, I'm an associate staff pathologist at the Cleveland Clinic. There's the Cleveland Clinic in the background. Here's Raza. I got that off the website. Hope that's okay. It's a beautiful picture. Different tie. That's I almost warned you. So the objectives for this session is to review the Papanicolaou Society of Cytopathology System for Reporting Paid Variability Cytology. It's one of those smaller blue books that we always talk about. We want to talk about the rate of malignancy based on the individual categories and talk about what's in the individual categories. And then kind of talk about some of the future goals of the system and what you guys are doing with it. In the future. So uh, background pancreatic lesions uh, is a very broad differential diagnosis and it ranges from benign to pre-malignant to malignant. Um, an accurate preoperative diagnosis is critical, especially because many times this results in ripple procedures and uh, the EUS, uh, FNA biopsy, the pancreas is high sensitivity and specificity, which was nicely demonstrated in this meta-analysis that showed that the sensitivity and specificity were 92%, 96% respectively. So uh, standardization of reporting categories were designed to allow for kind of more flexible patient care and, you know, to translate across a multiple disciplinary team. You know, without having these categories, sometimes these reports can be difficult for the um, clinicians to understand exactly you know, what the diagnosis is. And so you, uh, they, they divide it into six different categories, non-diagnostic, negative, atypical, neoplastic, benign or other, which is interesting, uh, suspicious and positive. And this is, can all be seen within what we're calling the PSC system. So um, here is slide eight. So I just wanted to get some comments on uh, your experience. And uh, there's a lot of entities in these, in, in these individual categories. Yes, absolutely. And, and really, and as you, as you sort of uh, recapitulated, it really does cover a broad range of, of, of lesions, right? They're both non-neoplastic and neoplastic. And in the neoplastic realm, uh, there are those that have malignant potential, and there's some that we don't consider, uh, we consider very indolent. Um, and there is controversy about how to, how to really manage them. Uh, so it really does take a multidisciplinary team, uh, as was done in, this, in the formulation of this guideline, as with many other guidelines, uh, to understand what one is supposed to do when faced with such a diagnosis. And when you get a category, um, uh, like such as neoplastic other, for example, which, which may be confusing, as I think you alluded to. Um, but what does that mean and what is, what is a clinician supposed to do? Is it supposed to operate or not operate? And when it, came, it comes to a category like this, and I'll focus on this one because this is the one that is similar to, I think, in the Milan system where you have the subcategory. Subcategory, yes. Uh, you have um, salivary gland neoplasm of un, uncertain malignant potential. 
Uh, Nibasic other really kind of tries to capture that idea of other. And one thing that we, that we wanted to hesitate, well, you can see there's uh, neuro, neuroendocrine tumors, well differentiated, which that's a, in and of itself a whole topic of discussion. Uh, IPMNs are interruptible papillary mucinous neoplasms and mucinous cystic neoplasms. Both have uh, malignant potential. And there are varying degrees amongst them. Uh, and the reason why we wanted to sort of keep it, or why the, the people who created the system wanted to keep it as an other, is they didn't want to hamstring the surgeon into forcing them to, to perform a procedure like a Whipple, as you, as you mentioned. It is quite a quite an extensive procedure, and it does uh, have a tremendous outcome in a patient's uh, lifestyle and, and pancreatic function uh, over the course of their, their subsequent you know, post-operative lifestyle. Um, we didn't want to hamstring them into forcing them to do it. Uh, radiologists also have their own criteria. They call it worrisome features or, or low-risk features. In this, we wanted to use the idea of new plastic other. Um, in this paper, and I think we're going to talk about that, we wanted to hone in on how do you differentiate the malignant potential in that. Because all, all of us can agree. Negative for malignancy, we're going to survey it. Right. Uh, neoplastic benign, we're going to serve them. Anyone who has a pancreatic lesion uh, on MRI or NCT that's found incidentally in yeah. lomas will be followed. Right. So that's not yes. the question. The question is, when do we operate and do we operate? Okay. Yes, uh, you, you can't shoot the one out of my sales. I was going to say, you know, um, I think the system's very similar to the Milan system yes. in that, you know, I think kind of some of the difficulty with dealing with pancreatic lesions is just the sheer amount of different types of lesions that you can find. You know, in the Paris system, it's negative for high grades. Right. It's, right. it's negative yes. for high grades. Much easier, I, I think, to a certain extent, um, both Bethesda systems, so the Bethesda um, uh, for cervical cytology, you're mainly looking for a squamous intraepithelial lesion, although you do see some glandular lesions. But it's very focused, where I think this is, I think that's an apt uh, uh, comparison to make, or an apt comparison to make. Thank you. Uh, that it is like the salivary gland in that there is a lot of different tumors slash lesions that, that come from this particular gland, which yeah. which makes it very difficult, I think, to create a reporting system around. Right. And right. a lot of nuances. A lot of nuances. Very good. So what did you guys do? You reviewed the experience at MGH uh, in a prospective one-year study to evaluate the associated risk of malignancy with each diagnostic category of the system. You took all patients, and again, as said, uh, one year, it was 2016, and the cytologic material that was produced um, was the direct smear cytospin and SurePath. And also, be your comments on that. I mean, I noticed that you said in the direct smears it was all fixed in ethanol. What's, what's, what's ROSE like at uh, MGH? Uh, so um, this, that's actually a good question. Um, we do do uh, ROSE fixative. Um, we do, we do, uh, sorry, we do air dried smears. I'm not sure why it says here ethanol phase, uh, but we did do H&E for the, uh, for their, for our rapid indication. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> and then tell me a little bit about SurePath. Um, I, I, I don't know many, I've never seen a SurePath slide before. I've mm -hmm. heard about it. Yes. Well, here we now use ThinPrep and, and the majority of labs do use ThinPrep. Uh, SurePath, I think the saying goes that everything looks malignant on SurePath and everything looks benign on PinPrep. And I'll, I'll say as someone who's done both, uh, that is definitely the case. I think some of the appreciations that one, one has for SurePath is that you have a maintenance of the architecture and that you can really see three-dimensional clusters. That being said, obviously, both of them are, are perform equally well. Uh, it's just whatever you're used to. But I do I do like seeing those, especially in, in, in IPMS, for example, just really large papillary clusters really do come clearly on SurePath. On SurePath, the papillary, yeah. OK. Tell me about cytospin. Uh, that's something that we do use uh, on occasion. Uh, it does have a tremendous amount of artifacts sometimes. Okay. Uh, sometimes you can see that a lot of those cells are air dried, um, but it does take it in place too. And we do that mainly for, for cystic lesions. So what is your favorite uh, preparation to look at pancreas? Uh, Liquid-based. Liquid-based? Liquid -based. I, I think it's a very great um, tool. I think it's a powerful tool. Uh, and it really does give you a good sense of what, what is in a, an imperial that's both used for solid and cystic lesions. It really is a helpful uh, preparation. But of course, any the best sample is that that is diagnostic. Ah, regardless of whatever. Diagnostic's good, huh? Diagnostic is best. That's good, yeah. 
you know, I find myself liking liquid base more and more, um, especially we use them in thyroids here along with the direct smears. And, you know, it's a little difficult uh, initially to get used to the liquid base, but there's something about having one slide um, with all the material on it. You're not searching around, um, you know, you know, these slides that just have mostly blood, you know, there's something about the liquid base I, I really like. It's very consistent. Okay. All right, so um, <clears throat> pancreatic cysts within the neoplastic other category were further stratified by the presence of high-grade atypia or not. And so these are the five features of uh, high-grade atypia. Uh, do you want to comment on, on high-grade atypia at all? Or? Yes, and I think we talked about it a little bit at the at Twitter last night. Yeah, um, we have a figure too, if you yes. want me to move forward. No, no, I mean, I think this is, we can, we can show the figure as well. Okay. Um, but this is really the the essence of the, of the paper and, and why it's important to separate out. So what do we do about this neoplastic other category? When do we operate? Do we operate? And all these answers really can be, can be all these questions can be answered by the presence or absence of hybrid. I think that's a single determining factor in this category um, because this is really, these are really the lesions and we'll see further on in the paper as the results show that these are the determining factors of what is a moment. We identify these, and this is with Dr. Pittman, uh, this is a 2014 paper, this is the criteria that she put out, um, that really the, the presence of these, in particular, the uh, abnormal chromatin pattern, the background cellular necrosis, and the increased uh, nucleocytoplasmic ratio, these were the factors that were the most uh, important in recognizing uh, malignancies and, and high-grade dysplasia in these in these neoplastic instruments. So one, um, of these features I found interesting was the small cell size. Yes. Um, generally, when you think of malignancy, you think of increased cell size. Right. I like I like to think of it akin to finding H cell on a. On a okay. Yes. Um, it's not. It's not um, that uh, the the nuclear features are not like H cell in, in most categories, in most ways, other than the, the high and C ratio. But uh, and cells don't really reminisce. But I think in terms of that size, that's what we look. Okay, that makes uh, sense. Present in cluster. Immature. Exactly. Immature, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So here's the figure from the paper. Uh, anything you want to comment on here? Or? No, so so here we see really a, a progression from uh, low-grade, uh, you know, mucous dysplasia to high-grade. Uh, and I believe high-grade is shown here in the top right uh, in one of our groups. And this is what we mean by the small cell size. You can see really they look reminiscent at low power of, of a, uh, you know, H-cell diagnosis especially in, 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 uh, in the thin prep uh, preparation, which is there in, in categories there in figure C. Yes, figure C, yeah. Yeah, you can definitely see it. Right. Um, sure. And it really is also in the presence of, of background cell intercourse that really helps me uh, make that determination. And this is really what's important, regardless of you, in the systems where we are in, in situations where we use the PAP Society guidelines, like we don't do that here. But um, yeah. but we do make a diagnosis of neoplastic mucinesis, and we do comment on the presence or absence of high grade atypia. Yeah, yeah, it is really all about the high grade atypia. Yes. Um, and so you think necrosis is really necrosis helpful. Necrosis is great, yes. Okay. All right, so uh, the method. So um, you guys correlated with histologic or clinical, if you couldn't get histologic. Um, there was concurrent subsequent, obviously, tissue samples. And uh, the true positives were considered lesions with high-grade dysplasia, adenocarcinoma, and neuroendocrine tumor. Right. Um, and you said because these lesions have demonstrated either malignant or in case of adenocarcinoma, or lesions with high-grade dysplasia according to our reported study. So you included high-grade dysplasia, adenocarcinoma, and neuroendocrine tumor. And it'd be hard to differentiate between adenocarcinoma and high-grade dysplasia on a Correct. And that's, and that's ultimately what we're trying to say. But yeah. it is very difficult. And, and you know, in an IPMN, an intrafil um, mucinous or probably mucinous neoplasm, it really is hard to tell. Yeah. But that is the point of hybrid dysplasia. It is almost indiscernible from from that person. Which is why in, in, in a cystic setting, right? In a solid setting, of course, right. Yes. Um, and one thing that is interesting here, and this is something that, that's going to be touched on uh, in the in our future directions, but the inclusion of neuroendocrine tumor as a malignant histology. That's something that is um, in debate uh, in the cytology realm, but in the in our surgical uh, pathology uh, kind of field, the WHO does classify uh, neuroendocrine tumors and carcinomas as malignant epithelial processes of the pancreas. Interesting. So even 
carcin carcinoid light tumors. Correct. Yeah. They, it's placed in the malignant setting. Yeah. But you'll notice that in neuro in, in neuroendocrine uh, or in neoplastic other that well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors are included. And neuroendocrine carcinomas in the Papillary Society guidelines are are classified as malignant. Correct. Okay. So uh, if you didn't have any corresponding histologic findings, um, malignant cytologic categories are classified as true positive if you had clinical follow-up and or imaging that demonstrated overt malignant features. Right. And again, I think the key word here is overt. Right. And and pancreatic adenocarcinoma is, is one that is not a subtle disease. Right? Uh, it will declare itself. Um, and, uh, you know, my mentor was very clear that, you know, you, you knew when, when a patient, when you Overdiagnosed that, and of course, because if they were still alive, you know, in five years, I mean, it's the unfortunately, truth. yeah, unfortunately, yeah. It's the truth. Um, but it is important that that we do maintain a high uh, sensitivity in these and a high specificity in these cases because we are relegating someone to a Whipple, we are relegating someone to neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, regimens, and uh, we may not have any more material. That may be the only diagnostic material. Um, yeah, especially in the neoadjuvant. Yes. yes. Uh, benign findings were considered as true negative cases based on the corresponding histologic findings demonstrating. So if you had a benign neoplasm, a serious cystadenoma, or as you just mentioned, if there's no corresponding histologic findings slash the clinical follow-up data, there was no emergence of malignant features in neoplasm, which is probably why you went with 2016 in the 2019 paper. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. You have, you have these, two yeah. years should be enough. It should be enough. But yeah, it would declare itself if it's an adenocarcinoma. Right. So um, you guys are busy over there, you know, 334 specimens, pretty much 50-50 in men, women, 61.1 um, uh, uh, years of age is the, the mean, um, that's a lot. Yes, we were very busy, very busy in our service. So of those 334 lesions, about half were cystic, the other half were solid. Um, the majority of them were in the head of the pancreas, 41%. Um, and about evenly split between the tail and the body afterwards. Um, less commonly, uh, the lesions found in the neck were, were 5.7, uncinate 2.7, peri uh, pancreatic, very, very few, 2.8, and in the main doctor, another one specified 1.8%. Clinical follow up, pretty good, 18 months, so you had a year and a half um, was the median time. Um, histologic follow-up was uh, about 41 percent of cases and I imagine most of the histologic follow-ups were those of malignant neoplasms um, and clinical follow-up on 197 so pretty good cohort um, you had core needle biopsies in 71 uh, next generation uh, needle biopsy samples 51 percent 45 whipples um, 21 percent distals so of those 66, uh, 66 surgical specimens, um, which encompass only the whipples and the distals, 46 were malignant on resection, and so that was about 70%. Right. And some of these may be done because of symptomatic reasons. Absolutely, yeah. So it's not always uh, for malignancy that we do. But functioning neuroendocrine tumors, uh, we will do them. Obviously, that would have actually been considered as malignant here, but if someone has a structure that's really not elated, uh, a long history of chronic pancreatic Yeah. Right. Yeah, but nonetheless, um, so tell me a little bit about this table. This is kind of your your big table. Here, right. right. So, um, I mean, essentially what we see here is a slow progression from um, the uh, negative for malignancy to positive malignancy in terms of the malignant cases that we see here. As you can see, uh, in a patient, in patients who, who got the diagnosis or interpretive category of uh, negative for malignancy, we have about 1% malignant rate. Uh, when it comes to a typical, but 28%, and then slowly increasing uh, from there. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out, and this is something that, again, I think is, is unique to the pancreatic system, and uh, they want to emphasize is the neoplastic other category. If you were to take all comers, low and high uh, grade atypia, it is about 30% uh, in ter terms of its malignant rate. But when you separate out the low uh, grade atypia from high grade atypia, you can see that that rate changes from four, it goes 4.3 to 90%. And that's really what we're looking for. Big difference. Yes, big difference. And that's why it really is critical to, to identify those with low, low grade atypia and high grade atypia. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the non-diagnostic category and the 7.7% there. Yes, so essentially um, 
our, the, the way that we uh, use the non-diagnostic category is that if in, a, in the presence of a mass, we have a tissue that does not explain it, if we have a sample that does not explain the mass, uh, then we call it non-diagnostic. And okay. sometimes it could be due to scan cellularity, um, and most often that's actually is due to uh, scan cellularity. And that is actually contaminant. contaminant. Exactly. And that's where we can get issues like even with high-grade uh, atypia that um, or sorry, with, with low-grade tippy that are malignant, it really comes to sampling. Right. And we're at the mercy of our endoscopists. And that's true. I mean, if you look at the uh, low-grade atypia, 4.3%, right. just because you do not see high-grade atypia doesn't mean that there isn't high-grade atypia somewhere in the lesion. And same with the non-diagnostic exactly. category. Yes. I will say it is pretty amazing that your negative for malignancy is at 1.0. I mean, that's, that's having a very strict criteria. Okay. That is... Um, and actually, the, the false negative is, a, is an interesting case, but it really does come down to sampling uh, rather than interpreting. I think I'm obviously, a, we were blessed to have a very great technology team, as we do here. Uh, mm -hmm. And having a person who develops the criteria system in your life helpful. is very helpful. Yes. Yeah, so I noticed our activity <laughs> rates uh, for urines in both uh, Cornell and Loyola were very low. So yes. We had a lot of, you, when you have a lot of the Paris people yes. there. Yeah. Yes. So here's your next table. And so I actually was hoping if you could comment a little bit about the difference between absolute risk and relative risk. Sure. So absolute risk is really um, honing in on uh, looking at the actual uh, data, right? You want to see uh, in terms of all of your uh, histologic and, and clinical follow-up data, you want to get the raw number. Uh, incorporating all the categories. Relative risk, really, you want to you want to uh, establish that, and it, actually, in this case, it's pretty easy because the negative from malignancy rate is one. Yeah. So uh, it really is in terms of its relationship to a negative category. Uh, here, it's the same. Yeah, same. Uh, but uh, in in terms of uh, its importance, uh, here, um, it's important to see how you're doing. Uh, and what your what your category means. If you have a very high absolute rate uh, risk of malignancy uh, in your uh, atypical category, uh, then you may be your group may be under calling adenocarcinoma. Got it. Um, and the relative risk helps you understand how you're doing compared to the negative for malignancy category. Got it. Are we missing mm -hmm. um, tissues? Is, is it interpretive, or is it um, the fact that we're undercalling uh, non-diagnostic samples. I know that sometimes we have a tendency to call things negative from malignancy if there is a benign uh, tissue on the slide, but is it truly a negative uh, right. sample or is it a non-diagnostic sample? Right. Um, so it's important to really have the, the clinical, the radiologic, and, and cytologic correlations done at the time of sign -up. Interesting, and then also I uh, just wanted to get your comment on the p-values. It looks like your low-grade atypia was not significant, uh, Correct. but the rest were. And likewise with neoplastic benign. Yes. And that's how you want it to be in this setting because um, we don't want there to be any difference between the negative for malignancy category, neoplastic benign, which would include something like a serous cystadenoma, and, and low-grade activity, which would be something like a low-grade dysplastic um, intra, uh, sorry, intraductal pathway cystic neoplastic. Right. Those, pa those patients can be followed. Correct. Then uh, the last uh, table here, table four, the performance. Right. And so this is where we wanted to really assess at what uh, category, at what diagnostic interpretation do we operate. Okay. And so, again, we're, we're relegating someone to uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the setting of calling it uh, positive malignancy, uh, a Whipple uh, procedure. And so we want to maintain both a high sensitivity and a high specificity. You don't want to give someone a basically a terminal diagnosis right. if they don't need it. Yeah, um, I think specificity is key correct. in something like this. Yeah, and so this with this sort of uh, table, we wanted to show what categories uh, can be uh, can can be spared surgery, can be uh, followed, and which ones can can be safely uh, gone uh, you know, uh, su submitted to a Whipple procedure, for example. And here again, the, the Papillary Society guidelines do not incorporate high-grade atypia into their category system. But here we wanted to show how important it is to right. uh, add that to the diagnosis. Yeah. And so you can see the first uh, table here, the specificity, specificity really suffers, and so does the positive predictor value. When you have when the you, other. When you have the other and when you have atypical. But when you start adding in the high-grade atypia, it slowly creeps up, and really the, the, the 
as if you're going to use Goldilocks as the uh, metaphor. Yes, yeah. The, the, just soup, right. the soup that's just right is neoplastic plastic other with high grade. Uh, atypia is suspicious and positive. Yeah. Th this would be the one that would be, if, if someone who has this diagnosis should should be either, you know, uh, if we use that as our malignant category, then uh, that will be the best performance. Yeah, and, and I think it's really important to stress that, you know, patients who end up with a high grade or suspicious or positive, you know, the clinicians will act on it. They will act on it. It reminds me um, of upper tract uh, urine where you have to be very, you want to be very specific, right? You want to make sure that if you call something positive or suspicious, that it's positive um, when, when it comes out because um, there may not be an additional biopsy or another tissue diagnosis besides your own call. So I think the whole point I really think with this is, and what I think is really impressive is the 98.8% specificity with the other high grade suspicious and positive group. Um, so I thought this was really brave. You guys went in and you delineated your false positive and false negative cases. Um, I thought it was great. Uh, you know, as a junior junior physician here, um, it's always nice to know where the pitfalls are, and it's hard not to walk and in, to fall into a pit if you don't <laughs> know what the pits are. So again, there are very few cases of false positive, but you did delineate two. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to talk about those real quick. So the first one was a 74-year-old guy. He had a 3.3 centimeter cyst. Um, you know, in the EUS FNA specimen, uh, you guys said there was high NC ratio, small cell size, which we touched on. And you said it was in keeping with intermediate grade. And then it came out being as intermediate grade. Is that really false positive? Well, so uh, in keeping with intermediate to high, high. Yeah. So um, I would say... Technically, yes. Okay, because um, you call it high. And, and, yeah. and I think something that we notice is that, obviously, much like the bladder, for example, in a cystic neoplasm of the pancreas, you have cells that are degenerating. Right. If they're rounding down. There's, there can be some sort of artifactual atypia that's, that's, that's introduced by being in a cystic space. That being said, if, if you were to look at the radiology criteria, this is a, a worrisome cyst. It's, it's greater than three centimeters. It's in the head of the pancreas. Um, and I believe they had some some symptomatic uh, issues. That, uh, did this person need to get a, a Whipple uh, based on the cytology diagnosis? Uh, it's still intermediate grade. It's a side branch IPMN. Of course, in, in this setting, uh, I think a surgeon would say using the uh, using their management their current management guidelines, this is someone who's an optimal candidate. And yeah, I think everyone can agree that a, a cyst that's greater than three yeah. centimeters. Yeah, three point three is pretty big. Right. Yeah, the pancreas. I'm sure it was causing problems. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I think it's something to keep in mind, and it's something that we wanted to bring up with this case is that sometimes in, in cysts you introduce this sort of artificially high grade. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and again, it's, it's very difficult difficult when you have degeneration right. in a specimen. So you want to talk about this one? 65-year-old woman, 2.8, cystic lesion, acinar cyst, acinar cell cyst adenoma. Yes. This is this is a this is a true pitfall. Okay. We is it a common pitfall? No. Okay. Uh, this was actually published as a case report from one of my colleagues. I saw uh, that. Yeah. Chen. Chen, yeah. Uh, who's uh, actually now in Portland? And um, again, uh, by the guidelines, this really kind of doesn't fall into the worrisome features because it's less than three less than three centimeters for a cystic oh, space. I mean, it's pretty close. Is, correct. But I think what's important is that we do have rare entities that really can mimic. Uh, high grade. This, yeah. this is something that I don't think many people uh, would be able to to diagnose, and I think would be very difficult to diagnose on on. Uh, yeah, and, and 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 if you you know if you diagnosed it on uh, FNA, you'd probably be wrong yeah. more than you were right. Right? Yeah, it's one of those uh, zebras. I mean, acid or cell proliferations for me in general are very difficult. Yes, um, yeah. you know because the, the pancreas in and of itself is. Is made up of, but this was a cyst, yeah, correct, that's, right? Yeah, that's, and and in, the, and in the 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 especially in the tail where you have a predominance of acinar groups, yeah, it can be very difficult to discern. Am I in a lesion? Am I not in a lesion? Yeah, because this cyst, as you mentioned, yeah, it can be very challenging. So this one, I urge you to read to read her case report. This is really a great, great case, and I I don't know how common this is. I don't think this is very common. Yeah, um, and it, it's something that we fell we fell uh, victim to again. 
you know, I, I really appreciate you guys publishing or people publishing all this, uh, all this stuff. Um, you know, mostly it'd be very easy to glance over it, right? You know, we report the rates and malignancies, but going into detail about the different cases that, you know, either fooled you into the positive or fooled you into the negative. I don't know if the word fooled is, is correctly used here, but um, uh, that, that one called positive, which ended up not being positive, I think it's very helpful, especially, I, I, it's very helpful for, for everyone. But if we, if we want to incorporate high-grade atypia into a category system, I think we need to be real, really honest with ourselves on how is the diagnostic performance. Right. Again, it is, and I think we talked about this last, yesterday too, the value of doing these kind of reviews and, and gaining the absolute risk of the relative risk of the your institution of, of, the, of nationwide, it's important to know how we are doing in terms of these, these cases, because our diagnoses do have real-world implications. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, and especially you, in, you learn that very quickly when you start practicing. Yes. Yeah, yes, and so it is. It is important. Yes, yeah. and if we want to, to uh, better our system, which again, uh, I think we'll talk about that in the introductions. But um, if we want to incorporate high grade tip, if we want to make it a, 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 a to be honest, system, yeah. yes, that is important to see where it does fall short. And again, you know, two cases out of three hundred. Sure. Yeah. Yes. So here you had ten false negative cases, and again, you know. How much is this a sampling? 7.8%. Yeah, so um, so the evaluation was limited by scan cellularity, and um, all were actually in the atypical category. So, you know, you, you, when you when you start incorporating, uh, incorporating the atypia category into a false negative, you know, I think I think you guys are, you know, um, holding the bar pretty high here because. You know, you, you did say it was atypical, and that that is actually something that if you go back to the the overall number of cases we had in each category, atypical is something we very rarely utilize. Yeah. I think it's it's something that if, if we cannot re rely on it as a crutch in these scenarios, because we do want to give a, a true um, recommendation to our colleagues who are, right. who are seeking help. We have the radiology uh, impression, we have the radiographic impression, they have their clinical impression, but we need to give them our impression. And it doesn't help, it, unless you use sparingly, I think it was about 28 cases that we had out of 300 um, yeah, that's a goal. That, that's nothing in pancreas. Right. Um, and yeah, and, you know, that, that was actually, you know, again, I always go back to the parasystem because that's what I know. But, um, you know, that was a drive in the whole parasystem to have the negative high grade. And the yes. whole reason to have it was because if you looked at some of the atypia rates pre Paris at some institutions, and these are academic institutions, some of them were up 40, 50%. And, you know, what's a clinician supposed to do with atypia, right? Well, we know now that most urologists kind of ignore it. Right. Yeah, well, now you almost have to retrain them because, yeah. you know, we use it so rarely that they should yes. be alerted to it. But but uh, anyway, all of, all of the false negatives, there was only seven cases out, out of over 300. Uh, all were called atypia. Four were uh, ductal adenocarcinomas. Two metastatic renal cell carcinomas. Is that like a common thing for you guys? No, well, it is. It's a good teaching point that it is the most common yes. metastatic uh, to the pancreas, uh, notwithstanding, of course, lymphoproliferative disease. But uh, it is the most common. And it does happen, and it is often a situation where, and this is just something for some of the trainees out there, that uh, oftentimes a patient will remember the renal cell carcinoma diagnosis. Uh, the Surgeon, certainly the surgeon or the or the treating physician will not remember because they right. don't know. And uh, it won't won't be until the radiologist points out that there's one kidney missing uh, that we, we learn of it. Or it's cytology, and it happens in thyroid very frequently. Uh, and these are very late presenting metastatic diseases. Exactly. So, yeah, I was just gonna say that, you know, RCC is one of those tumors that can come back, you know, ten, you know, five, ten, fifteen years. Yeah. It's just not aware of it does happen. It does happen, yeah. And, and for the pancreas, RCC is most common. Uh, in two false negative cases, um, the biopsy specimens demonstrated a mucous neoplasm with epithelial cells with low intermediate grade with no evidence of high grade. And in those cases, one case, um, mucinous uh, etiology was established by the presence of thick extracellular mucin. In the second case, um, uh, the CEA was uh, uh, 223.4. So uh, I thought this was a good point to talk about um, or, um, um, chemistry. You know, how often uh, are CEAs and uh, amylases sent, and uh, how often do you rely on them? I, I think it's, it's valuable information.
situation. And I know, I think we talked about it on, on Twitter again yesterday, that sometimes uh, some situations where, where it's a send out test, like it is at our, at our institution, but it takes two to four days. Sometimes it's done in-house like it was uh, at our, at, uh, and sometimes it's sent out and then we won't hear for weeks. Yeah. And I know even our some of our colleagues at our at our satellite institutions we were actually talking about it uh, last week about how long it sometimes takes to get CA yeah. back. Um, that being said, I it's valuable information. I, I think it's great. I think uh, you know the, the cutoff uh, of 192 uh, nan, nan, you know, uh, nanograms per milliliter is something that establishes with certainty. We we obviously miss abuses uh, in plasmas because we do have a high threshold, but we certainly uh, retain a lot of the, the cases, and it is very helpful. And at, at our at MGH, we used to call it neoplastic other uh, based on the on the C alone. Um, I know here uh, we don't do that, but we do also have a special stain. Yeah, it's a mucin. We do Alshin Blue PAS. Yeah, so no. Uh, for the people who don't know about this, we, we do a special stain, and I've actually called an IPMN on um, the stain only. Correct. Yeah. So it, you're, you're looking into that. That's, in, uh, that's something you're researching. And, and really, you know, we want to delineate. I think this is something that a lot of side of just uh, have an issue with is how do we know where the reason is coming from? That's, that's really yeah. the case, and that's why we use CEA. That's why I think it's helpful. In the absence of thick extracellular mucin, we call it colloid-like. Um, it really, and that's something that is really made from, from a pancreatic mucin system. You can see actually at the time of uh, sampling how thick and viscous uh, material is. And usually on, on your requisition, there's a tiny gross description that will say thick, viscous. And that really is indicative of it. Of it do, you, or system do you want to talk a little bit? Because I think it's, I think it's very interesting that Alcine Blue PAS saying a little bit about the, the pH and Sure. The the color of a positive uh, mucin stain. Absolutely. So again, so uh, we talk about where the mucin is coming from. Is you want to separate? Do do we need you know, sort of gastric contamination, especially in the head of the pancreas? We are sampling through the duodenum to get to the head. Um, we use this alpha blue PES to really determine the the presence of both acid and neutral mucin. Okay. Uh, and that's something that we found is characteristic. Or uh, I can mention it was Dr. Biscotti uh, who implemented that here. And, uh, he's oh, our, well. Yes, he's one of our cytopathologists yeah. in our department who was here for, for his entire career and actually last year retired. Um, but he and Dr. Walsh, who's, who's one of our uh, very prolific uh, pancreatic surgeons, really use this. And, and now you see how frequently our endoscopists will ask us to perform it, this. It's, it's on the requisition, <laughs> yeah. And, and more often than not, we'll actually have that request rather than sent for CEA. Yeah, it's true. And anyway, so what's cool about this is that you look for the royal yes, purple. Yes, the royal purple. So royal it is, the, purple, it is yes. the, the, you know, the ocean blue, as the name would imply, is blue, and PS can stain this bright magenta. But when you have the, the two um, stains uh, sort of uh, overlapping, we have that uh, mix of the magenta and blue, um, then you then you achieve this royal purple. And yeah. it really is a beautiful thing. It's style. quite striking, yeah. So uh, look out for uh, Raza's. He's going to have a paper on this, our experience with the uh, Alcium Blue PAS thing. But um, I have used it, and it, and I have been able to make a diagnosis of at least a mucinous neoplasm without really having the epithelium to back it up. And it helps with the thin mucins, particularly. So. Right, yeah. The ones that you, you're not sure if it's really from an IPMN or if it's contaminant. All right. We're moving on. Um, so, the, okay, back to the false negative cases. Um, so this was a 65-year-old woman, uh, 3.7 solid mass that had a pancreas. There were ductal cells. It was classified as negative. It was accompanied by a note in the cytopathology report that advised, a, you know, clinical correlation. I put that in all my re- – no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, it advised clinical correlation because you guys thought that this may not be representing that 3.7, yes. you know, mass and it ended up being it. A ductal adenocarcinoma, and, you know, with, with any cytology sampling error is going to be a problem. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And which, which I think this is what it was, yeah. Um, and then non-diagnostic. So, um, I, you know, it's very interesting to talk about non-diagnostic. Um, you know, you guys had 39 cases. Not much. Not much, but 11%. And then the absolute risk of malignancy was 7.7%. Uh, and you, again, it, it, this is great. You guys talk about everything. So uh, one patient had an FNA biopsy that's consistent with an autoimmune pancreatitis. We see that not infrequently. And then of the remaining ones, five had uh, surgical resections, three malignant, and that included both an adenocarcinoma and a lymphoblastic leukemia. 
and be tough. Um, <laughs> and then three benign processes, uh, night PMN, uh, low grade pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasm, and serosystenoma. So again, it, it, it's non diagnostic is obviously sampling, right? right. And and it really are, is improved with um, you know operator skill. Obviously, if you're if you're at a busy center where Nuspits are, are well right. trained in these and have great experience, then it helps. And the advent of the next generation sampling needles, where you actually get a, a piece of the, of the side of the cyst, really does help. Those needles are amazing. Yeah. There's with Shark Core. Shark Core yeah. and um, True Cut. Okay. The other one. I haven't seen the True That's Cut. Best. Heard about the Shark Core. Yes. They've got great names. For those <laughs> great. Names. Yes. Yeah. I bet they cost a lot. Right. So, uh, no, I just want to discuss a little bit about the limitations of your, uh, your study. And I know that you guys. I've been working on um, a subsequent study, and I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that. Sure. So, is there any anything you want to discuss as far as limitations? I mean, I, I think you know, I, and I alluded to this when when I was talking about the parasystem and working at Cornell and, and uh, Loyola, where you know our results are good. You know, our atypia rates are in the floor. You know, but it's also by the authors of the system. You know, where, you know, you guys are reporting fantastic results here. Do you think that there's, you know, is, is this applicable to Every academic institution, every institution. No, I mean certainly. Again, as we said, it really is operator dependent, and it is it is how experienced you are and how comfortable you are. Yeah, I think this is just our this is our experience. It's a pretty low activity rate, you guys. Correct. Said. Yeah, it, it is. It is uh, just how you practice, and you can see um, you know, depending on where you are, how, what and what really more importantly about not how how your diagnoses break down, but more. Do, do your clinicians and do your treating physicians know what to do with the diagnosis? Yeah. I think that's ultimately what's most important, regardless of what terminology you use, regardless of how frequently you call it. If they know what you mean, that's what's most important. Yeah, yeah. Communication's key. Right. And, uh, you know, we're on the phone all the time. <laughs> right. No, and, and, and that is the point of these NRI systems, right? Yeah. It is to have an idea yeah. and agreed upon, um, you know, mode of, of, of communication. But if, if your institution uses another system, if uh, but as, lo as long as they know what what you mean, yes, we, you know, we say we defer to a category. We don't we don't report a category. We say we must be consensus. Yeah, because we don't want to call it atypical. We don't want to call it malignant. We don't call it suspicious. Right. We don't give it a category. Yeah. But our our clinicians know what to do with that. Right. And I and I think that's one of the benefits of a system like this. Even if you don't use it, you know, lock, stack, and barrel, like right. you know, absolutely using it. Um, it it's nice to read about them and know about them because you know what's in each category, you know what to look for, and you know, you know, that if I have an IPMN, I have my um, royal purple stain, you know, what, what what am I looking for here? It's high-grade dysplasia. Correct. Yes. Right? You know, yes. I, you want to make sure that you are looking for high-grade dysplasia and you're reporting whether or not there's high-grade dysplasia. And your clinicians know that when you put high-grade dysplasia, that, that that's a positive result. Right. Regardless yeah. of how big the lesion is, this is something that's worrisome and should, should right. be acted upon. Right. In the right clinical setting, of course. Right. Uh, okay, so next, uh, if you have any other limitations, that's great. And then do you have any, you know, you want to talk about your, your next paper? Right. So this is actually something, again, I think we're alluding to it, but uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, is um, is going to put out the next uh, pancreatic, uh, pancreatic biliary reporting system. Uh, and in that system, there's actually going to be a category called pancreatic neoplasia, and that'll be low grade and high grade. And that will incorporate the criteria for high grade activity that we mentioned in this paper. So it is actually being incorporated. You were, you were before your time. I, I think this is because of the work of, of, of my mentors that ah. has been put through. And it is something that's really, it has value. We were able to demonstrate that it has value uh, and has, it, has an associated risk. That is far more significant than those with low grade. Right, and you can see you can see the breakdown yeah. even in this yeah. study that you know um, the rate of malignancy between was it was very high. It was like one was like two percent, the other was like ninety percent. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Big yeah. difference. Yes. And then the next the next thing is just to make it more streamlined and to more um, uh, streamlined with our surgical pathology colleagues. Neuroendocrine tumors of yes. all of all of all grades will be moving to the malignant category here. And that's just because it falls in the malignant category into the uh, into the uh, surgical pathology um, kind of classification of tumors. Yeah, I noticed that they um, in surgical pathology they have kind of pulled out that well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Right, yeah. but it's all listed in the malignant category. Interesting. Yeah, and it's something that I know that you know some of us struggle in, in grading 
uh, Nerner and Tumorous. Yeah. Uh, talk about that. On, talk about that on FNA at all. Are we, are we doing KI sixty sevens here? I do not do it. <laughs> I know there are studies that show uh, there's value added to it. Okay. It, it is quite difficult, and again, it it comes down to sampling. You're right. Right. Yeah. It really does come down to sampling. All right. So I just wanted to go over the conclusions real quick, and so there is a question. Uh, box that we have open. So if anyone has questions, you can type them in. Yes. Uh, but uh, the results of this prospective one-year study of 334 pancreatic lesions demonstrating, as you mentioned, the, it, it's not just the absolute risk of malignancy, it's the increasing risk of malignancy per category, right? And um, it kind of confirmed the utility of the six-tier diagnostic system, uh, the value of high-grade dysplasia and the neoplastic other category, which we talked about, uh, the idea of standardizing reporting so that we can translate our diagnoses into usable uh, material for the clinicians. And then uh, the diagnostic performance of the system is optimal when neoplastic other with high grade, suspicious, and positive were considered a positive result. So with that, we thank everyone for your attention. I, I Raza, I can't thank you enough for coming. I know it was a, a, a tiresome journey, Oregon Trail coming two feet across the <laughs> hall, but, but no, I appreciate, I really do appreciate your expertise. I learned a lot um, about uh, the system. I, I really, you know, I, I've had the book, I've read the book, but, you know, having a conversation about it and understanding, you know, the future directions and, and where it came from, I think really solidifies kind of the main points of the system. And and I think that even if you don't use it um, in your daily life, that it is it is very helpful to know, you know, what what is a positive result? What is a negative result? And then how do I communicate this effectively to clinicians? And also, what should the atypia rate be? I mean, um, how often should I be calling atypical? And, um, and, and how does that translate to clinicians? So I thank you very, very much for, uh, uh, for, for coming. And uh, we have the question uh, uh, box open. I think it's open. Um, it looks open. Right, Rasa? That's open, right? I'm not sure. We're not We're sure. Gonna, we gonna, think gonna, it's open. Um, I don't see any, I do see some dots here. Let's try that. There is a question oh. in the question box. It says, would like to know the special stain for IPMN. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. The, Actually, there is a question here. Guys, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we're learning as we go. No, go ahead. Talk, talk about no, it. I mean, again, this is, uh, this is something that really is from mucin in general. You have mucin on a, on a smear or a thin prep or actually any liquid base or uh, cell block, it just determines where the mucin is coming from. Right, so it, it's a it's a PAS dash Alshan blue. And it's so a pH 2.5. It's a pH 2.5, and actually what you do is you take one of the um, one of the smears. We actually take a direct smear or the thin prep. Yes, it can be on any preparation. Actually, one of my colleagues uses on the cell block. Oh, you used to? Oh, yeah. I did see the cell block. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. So you take the you take the stain. So you already have it, and if you you know if you have to scan it, take a picture of it if you want to keep that diagnostic material. But you basically take the the, the direct smear to thin prep or apparently cell block um, with the most mucin on it, and uh, we drop it off in our lab, and I believe they de-stain, restain, yes. and it's a pal uh, a PAS dash Alcyon blue two point four. And uh, you should you should look for it. He, uh, he submitted it to ASC, and um, the pictures are quite beautiful. I mean that that that's uh, royal purple. I mean I love the name, but also it's it's a beautiful stain. And and yeah, I mean uh, here I like I alluded to earlier. Um, <laughs> it went outside. I called it positive for uh, mucinous neoplasm. They sent it back as suspicious because there were no cells. But yes. but uh, but here they believe in it uh, very thoroughly. That if if this if if you get Again, it's about specificity. If you yes. get quintessential royal, and that's what your study showed, right? The new one that that's very specific. So if you get your quintessential royal purple staining, um, it's likely mucin from a cystic mucinous neoplasm. Now you can't comment on dysplasia because you have you no know, cells, but you can say that yeah, this is a mucinous neoplasm. And again, use your medical charts if you have them. I mean, I know people in private practice don't, but you know, if it's not a cystic neoplasm, I would, I would take a step back before calling it a cystic yes. mucinous neoplasm. Yes. Um, and of course, solid solid lesions can also mimic cystic neoplasms when they undergo cystic generation. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Classic linear endocrine tumors. Yeah, neuroendocrine tumors. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? 
your phone says it's 10 14 p.m my it's 10 14 p.m in cleveland right now <laughs> no, it's no it's not um i unplugged it once for one of these oh. uh i should have unplugged it for this i forgot um okay, okay. well uh, thank you raza thank you everyone thank you. uh this was a lot of fun uh let us know uh so i, I mean this is on youtube so there should be a comment section or if you want to email but um how does everyone feel about this type of um journal um entry uh conference because you're one of the few raza where we actually have someone and we're talking with the authors about it you know, do you do people find this more meaningful, memorable, or do you like just your standard journal um, journal club? So, you know, us at the e-journal um, uh, committee, we were always interested in feedback. But again, Raza, thank you. Thank you. Joanne, thank you. Dr. Barkin, all the people, thank you very much.